Hey, we in Western culture usually think of the pilgrims as people that came across the North Atlantic to escape religious persecution. However, if you were thinking that they were the first example of Europeans leaving their home to find a new life free of societal norms, then you'd be wrong. Today, we talk about the Boers of South Africa. Our story starts in 1652, when the Dutch East India Company decided to found the Cape Colony in the Cape of Good Hope in what is now present-day the country of South Africa. Its original intention was to be a way station for Dutch ships on their way to their colonies in Asia. When the Dutch landed, they easily secured their colony due to the lack of native inhabitation of the area. Most natives lived further inland. Following the establishment of a colony, a group of people left Europe for the colony, and these people became what is we now know as today, the Boers. They were a small group of French, Dutch, and Germans, and would eventually land in the Cape Colony and would begin to spread out into the surrounding areas. They easily expanded due to the sparseness of the natives, and when they did come into contact with the natives, the Boers easily defeated them in battles due to them having gunpowder weapons. The Boers were Protestant Christians that followed a branch called Calvinism, and they really emphasized their religion in their everyday lives. They actively pursued conversion efforts to natives, which were mildly successful, and they also had large families that focused very much on a strong family unit. The Boers are highly influenced by Dutch culture and formed a language called Afrikaans. Boer in Dutch and Afrikaans directly translates to farmer. Outside of the city of Cape Town, Boers held farms of up to 6,000 acres of land. They had no fences of land and distinction were very minuscule. Stables for horses and cattle, however, were located near the main compound and also doubled as a house. Boers had a large number of Spanish goats because the climate in South Africa was much like the climate in Spain. The status quo kept up for 150 years until in 1803, during the height of the Napoleonic Wars, the British Empire took control of the colony. Finally, in 1806, the Dutch officially gave up all sovereignty over the colony and it became part of the British crown. Thank you for watching. This is one part of a multiple part series about the Boers and how the country of South Africa ultimately came to be. I know this video is very short, but this is just getting basic information from around 1653 up until 1803, 1806 when the British finally took over. In the next episode, we will cover the Great Trek and it'll get much more interesting. I hope you guys enjoyed. Please leave a like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time. Have a great day. In 1806, the British finally took control of the Dutch colony for good. They renamed it the British Cape Colony. At first, things didn't really change up until 1820. Up to this point, British immigration had been very minor, but this all changed in 1820 when massive waves of up to 3,500 families began flooding the colony. With their arrival, the administration of the colony began to change. The British government replaced the administrational language of the colony from Dutch to English and then switched the currency of the colony from the Dutch Rijksdollar to the British Pound. By 1822, the mass of British immigrants and high European settler birth rates, along with poor land management, led to the population to grow to over 110,000 people and controlled a land area of 331,900 kilometers squared or 206,233 miles squared. This eventually led to the British to fight militarily over land with local tribes. The frontier wars were a set of battles between the Anglo-Dutch settlers and the British military against the Osa indigenous tribes. These battles happened due to the settlers wanting the fertile land that the Osa controlled. This led to the battles of Gokwana Kwembe and Ndelabambe and Gramstown over the lands between the Great Kai River and the Great Fish River. This eventually led to the Osa tribes being removed from their lands and the settlers taking over. In 1833, the British outlawed slavery in the Cape Colony, which heavily angered the Afrikaner population. This was due to the need for slave labor on massive Afrikaner farms. 
During this time, the economy of the colony was mostly made up of agriculture, with a little bit of manufacturing and shipping also thrown in. Much like how it was in the New World, families would control massive amounts of land and in turn would need slave labor to turn a profit. With the abolition of slave labor, the Afrikaner lifestyle became almost obsolete. This, along with the earlier administrational changes, would eventually set the stage and would become the catalyst for the Great Trek of the Boers. In 1838, the Great Trek began. The Great Trek was made by Dutch settlers called the Voortrekkers. The first group set out east due to the intense and desolate Kalahari Desert to the west and the mosquitoes that carried malaria to the north along with the tsetse fly, which would kill livestock. They set out from the eastern side of the colony and entered Zululand. The leader of the Zulu made a deal that if the colonists had brought back his stolen cattle, they could settle on his land peacefully. When they returned, however, with the cattle, they were massacred. 600 men, women, and children died. Hearing this, Andreas Pretorius led a punitive expedition of 470 boars to attack the Zulus. They encamped on the Nkome River. One morning, while waking up, Pretorius saw a mass of 20,000 Zulus arranged around the camp in battle formation. He acted quickly, and his men set up their wagons in a makeshift fortress called a lager. The Zulus charged and attacked. When the battle was over, the river was red with blood. 3,000 Zulus had died, and only three of the Boers were even wounded. From that day forward, the river would be known as the Blood River, and to this day, the Battle of the Blood River is an important symbol of Afrikaner pride and nationalism. Following this very lopsided defeat, another group of settlers left from Grahamstown and settled outside of the colony and created the Republic of Natalia. It became a very wealthy country, but this all ended in 1843, when the British marched troops in and annexed the Republic of Natalia. This led to the Boers again exodusing and crossing into the continent. They would create two more countries, the first along the Orange River and would be called the Orange Free State. The second would become known as the Transvaal and would settle around the Val River. In the next video, we will take a closer look at the Boer states in general. I hope you guys have all enjoyed this video. All the support I've gotten since starting this channel has been amazing and I really do thank everyone who has watched, liked, and subscribed. My goal was to start a channel that would hopefully shine a light on a lesser known part of history that I think really needs to be enjoyed or looked at more thoroughly. Thank you again. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Please share, like, and subscribe for more content, and I'll see you in the next video. Following the end of the Great Trek in 1852, the British Empire formally recognized the independence of the two Boer republics through the Sand River Convention and the Bloemfontein Convention. This secured the independence of the Boers, but at the same time left them in a precarious situation. To the north, west, and south lay the British Empire who was eager to expand into the Boer lands. To the east were the Zulus, and even farther to the east lay the Portuguese. The British and the Portuguese would exert power and influence over the Boers, however, the British mainly made up most of this conflict. The British, too, were under great pressure in the geopolitics of Africa. This all occurred as the scramble of Africa was beginning, and Britain was competing with both German and Portuguese colonial possessions in southern Africa, and later on these lands were discovered to have diamonds, in which case the Boer lands became an opportunistic area to expand into. In 1877, the British formally annexed the area across the Vaal River and named it the South African Republic. This angered the Boers, who saw this as a violation of the Sand River Convention and pretty much threw oil onto a pile of dry brush. Over the next three years, tensions would continue to rise until in December of 1880 when a Boer farmer got his wagon confiscated because he refused to pay an inflated tax. In retaliation, the British colonial administrators were going to auction off the wagon to pay for his taxes. At this moment, 100 armed Boers charged the auction, liberated the wagon, and began to beat up the head auctioner. 
These 100 boars then exchanged shots with the local government soldiers sent to arrest them. While no one was killed, this event was the metaphorical match that started the fire beneath the boars. A month later, the Transvaal officially declared their independence on December 16th, and four days later, the First Battle of the War started. The battle, which would later become known as the Battle of Bronkhorn Spruit, is still studied today by military historians because of the tactics used. In short, a British army convoy was sent to reinforce the garrison at Praetoria. 250 Boers ambushed the convoy of 260 British soldiers and absolutely annihilated them. After the battle ended, the total casualties stood at the following. Boer losses totaled 2 killed, 5 wounded. The British, on the other hand, totaled 156 killed and wounded and 112 captured. This battle is so important because of the tactics and equipment used by both the Boers and the British and how they contrasted from one another. Boer farmers had to rely on hunting every night in order to get their food. Since most of their rifles were single-shot breech rifles, they had to make their first shot count, otherwise the game would get away. This made the Boers extremely accurate shots and they would make use of the prone position and cover to pick off the British soldiers. Another major factor had to deal with how the Boer military was organized. The Boers didn't have a standing military and instead relied on the mobilization of the farmers to create small militia units they called commandos. Since these impromptu soldiers had no actual uniform, they would wear their beige work clothes out to the battlefield and this offered the prime amount of camouflage in the sun-baked highlands and veldt of the interior of southern Africa. The British, on the other hand, while they did use single rifles just like the Boers did, instead wore their bright red clothing out on the battlefield, which offered very little protection, absorbed heat like nobody's business, and also provided prime targets for Boer marksmanship. When you combine lower-ranged rifles with sticking out like a sore thumb, you start to see why the British took so many casualties. These aforementioned tactics were extremely effective here and would continue to be so in the remaining battles of the war. Another great example of this was the Battle of Lang's Neck, where a contingent of 2,000 Boers held off a well-armed British Natal field force, which had six pieces of artillery. The Boers easily repulsed the British attack by using the highlands to rain fire into the British ranks, and by the end of the battle, 14 Boers were killed and 27 were wounded while the British lost 84 men killed, 113 wounded, and two captured. The commander of this force was Major General George Coley, and following this defeat, he began to retreat back to friendly territory, leaving the forts under siege in the Transvaal to fend for themselves. Three weeks later, Major General Coley was busy reinforcing a British supply road, when suddenly, his scouts informed him that a large amount of mounted Boer soldiers were on their way. Hearing this, Coley fortified the heights in a square formation and loaded their cannons. 500 Boer mounted infantry took on the 240-strong British riflemen, 38 cavalry, and two cannons. The resulting Battle of Schunschucht was another costly defeat for the British. Boer casualties were 8 killed, 10 wounded, while the British lost 69 men killed and 77 wounded. The British force was only saved from total destruction because the Ngogo River swelled because of the rain and it prevented the Boer forces from pursuing the retreating British forces. The final battle of the First Boer War took place on February 26, 1881. Before this time, Major General Coley was introducing a truce that was beginning to be negotiated between his representatives and the Boers. However, in a very rash decision, Coley took 405 men to occupy the heights overlooking the Boer position. This threatened the Boers, and in turn, Nicholas Schmidt took 500 Boers to storm the heights. The resulting Battle of Majuba Hill is now considered the most embarrassing British military failure, even beating the Battle of Islandwana. By the end of the battle, the casualty stood at this. Out of a force of 500 men, the Boers lost one killed and five wounded. The British, out of a total of 405 men, had 92 killed, 134 wounded, and 59 captured. And the highest casualty of them all was Major General George Coley himself, who was shot and killed while ordering a fighting retreat. The final battle of the First Boer War was finished, and in turn was a spectacular defeat for the British, and to this day, 
is one of their worst tactical military defeats on the field by any army ever. The following peace was negotiated at O'Neill's Cottage on March 23, 1881, and made the Transvaal an independent country and expelled all the British troops inside the country. That being said, the British still had suzerainty over their nation, which meant that the British controlled their foreign relations. Still, the establishment of the Transvaal and the end of hostilities in only four months was seen as a major win for the Boers. While, at the surface, the First Boer War was an insignificant conflict on the fringes of a forgotten continent, the war would prove to be an extremely important part of world history. The first major impact of the war was the effect it had on the British mindset. Before the British endeavors in South Africa, the British military was seen as the mightiest military in the world. While East Sandawana stained the prestige of the empire, the loss to the Boers, who were mainly farmers and untrained or regular soldiers, heavily damaged the empire's prestige among its European competitors. This loss also became the first time since the American Revolution where the British military suffered a divisive, a decisive, and complete defeat. This war also saw the last time British regulars wore the red uniforms as the high command saw the advantages of beige and neutral color combat clothing. In short, few farmers from the South African veldt single-handedly ended the British red coat. This shock caused the British to begin to modernize and expand their military, a small stepping stone on the path towards World War I. For the Boers, the war established their nation and cemented their nationalism. Today, the First Boer War is still a massive sense of pride among the Afrikaner community. The absolute annihilation of the British army posed a challenge to Europe and its other empires. If the British could, could lose that bad to farmers, how could they stand up to the empires of the continent? Nearly 30 years later, we'll find out that Germany was listening at this very moment. And while the ending of the war brought peace to the regions of South Africa, the discovery of gold and diamonds would spark the conflict again to begin the Second Boer War. Thank you so much for watching this video. I've gotten a new microphone, and I hope you can hear the upgrade in the audio quality. If you enjoyed the video and want to support my content, please hit that like button, and if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. If you're a returning viewer or a new subscriber, remember to ring that alert bell so that you know I've uploaded a new video. Thank you, and have a wonderful day. In the past three videos in this series, I have discussed the story of the Boers from their early settlement of the South African Cape, the Great Trek, and then in this past video, the First Boer War, where they cemented their sovereignty on the continent. In this final installment in the history of the Boers, we will discuss the great climax in their struggle for recognition, the Second Boer War. In 1886, five years after the end of the First Boer War, a large gold field was discovered near the capital of the Transvaal, Pretoria. Following this discovery, thousands of people from around the world began to move to the Boer Republics in order to seek their fortune mining gold. These foreigners would later become known to the Boers as Oitlanders, or in English, Outlanders. This massive flood of foreigners to the Republics caused a massive demographic change. The once small shanty town of Johannesburg, for example, nearly overnight became a sprawling metropolis where foreigners outnumbered actual Boers. Many of these people were from the British Empire, and as such, the British began to take interest in the region again. To put this into perspective, it would combat this, Boer policymakers began to levy taxes and restrictions on the gold industry. These taxes made the Oitlanders mad because their money was being used on projects that only helped the native Boer population and not them. On top of this, President Paul Kruger gave a dynamite contract to a non-British company which angered the British government and became a reason for their soon-to-be war. Another reason also being the fact that President Kruger wanted to build a railway going from to the Transvaal through Portuguese East Africa to the ocean, subverting British control over the exportation of gold through their only ports. Tensions began to come to a head, and in 1895, Cecil Rhodes, the Prime Minister of the Cape Colony, sent a column of 600 men to attack and cause an uprising in and among the Oitlander population in the Transvaal. This failed miserably after 65 of his men were killed. The outcome of the Jameson Rays cannot be understated. Failure of the raid and the success of the Boers caused them all to rally behind President Kruger, and they also received some international praise. 
the latter of which came from the German Kaiser Wilhelm II, who congratulated the Boers for defeating the British. This caused a major stir in Britain, and anti-German sentiment grew, an ominous sign for things to come in the future. Following the Jameson Raid, President Kruger went back to work. In 1897, he signed a military pact with the other Boer nation, the Orange Free State, and he also sent out to overhaul the Transvaal military. He used the immense wealth the gold mining had created to buy massive amounts of military equipment. In 1897, he bought 30,000 of the model 1895 Mauser rifle, along with 50 million rounds of ammunition. In 1899, on the eve of the war, the Transvaal Army had a total of 73 heavy guns, including four 155mm Crusoe Fortress guns and 25 37mm Maxim Nordenfeldt guns. They even brought their own Maxim guns, which were bigger than the British and produced no smoke when shot. By the eve of the war, the Transvaal could call up an army of 25,000 fully trained and equipped men. The British at the time wanted to go to war because of the mistreatment of the British Oitlanders living in the Boer Republics. In order to prevent war, on May 30, 1899, a conference at Bloemfontein was called to negotiate, but it quickly broke down with, by the end of the day, both the British and the Boers issuing ultimatums to each other. The most important of which being the Boer one, which stated that the British had two days to remove troops from their right next to the borders, otherwise both the Transvaal and the Orange Free State would declare war. By the time London received this message, it was already too late, and war had begun. In the first days of the war, the Boers outnumbered the British nearly 3 to 1. On October 11, 1899, the day the war was declared, the British had about 13,000 troops on the front lines in comparison to the 33,000 Boer troops this number swelling to 40,000 by the end of the week because of more militia units coming together to fight. On October 12th, the Boers began to invade Natal and fought the British at the Battle of Crepan, which was swiftly won by the Boers. They continued to push towards Ladysmith, where they were tactically defeated at the Battle of Ellenslacht, but caused the British to retreat, leading to the siege of Ladysmith itself. On October 13th, a British force of 1,200 men were defeated by 6,000 Boers, and they proceeded to lay siege to, Ma to Mafeking. A final third Boer force of 7,500 men laid siege to Kimberley. The status quo like this would be kept up till in December, when the British tried to relieve all three of these sieges. The resulting infamous Black Week of the British Army should already paint a picture of how poorly this is about to go. On December 10th, a force of British troops attacked Boer positions at the Battle of Stormberg to recapture a British railroad station. This ended with 135 killed and 600 captured. The very next day, on December 11th, 14,000 British troops attacked the Boers during the Battle of Magersfontein in order to relieve the garrison at Kimberley and Maffa King. This ended with 120 British killed and 690 wounded, and both of those sieges kept on going. The apex of these defeats occurred at the Battle of Colenso, when, on December 15th, a force of 8,000 Boers defeated 21,000 British who tried to cross a river, resulting in 145 dead and 1,200 missing or wounded, and resulted in the Boers capturing 10 heavy guns and much ammunition. In January of 1900, the British had had enough. They sent over 180,000 troops overseas, their largest deployment ever up to that point in time. While it is at first started off very poorly with a major British defeat at the Battle of Spion Kop, the British soon turned their favor around. On February 10th, the British outflanked and defeated the Boers defending Magers Fontein, which opened up the British for two more successful battles on February 14th and 15th, the latter of which relieved the city of Kimberley. At the Battle of Perdersburg, which lasted 10 days from February 17th to the 27th, 4,000 Boers were forced to surrender. A day later on the 28th, the British relieved Ladysmith, albeit with taking 7,000 casualties. More bad news occurred when three months later the British retook Maffa King and on May the 18th annexed the Orange Free State. With one 
opponent defeated, the British continued to press into Transvaal. On June 5th, Pretoria was captured, and the remaining Boer forces were driven to the far reaches of the country, and the Boer government was forced into exile into Portuguese East Africa. This, however, by no means meant that the war was over. General Botha and his devoted Boers swore to continue on a guerrilla campaign. For the rest of the war, the British began to build defensive structures, such as blockhouses, to control areas where Boer raiding was still going on. They used 50,000 men to garrison these areas, which was in contrast to the still 30,000 Boers who were fighting in the guerrilla part of this war. To combat the guerrilla tactics, the British began a scorched earth policy, where they would burn and destroy areas where Boer commando units were receiving supplies. This also gave rise to the infamous concentration camps. While the term would become nearly synonymous with World War II, it was actually during the Spanish-Cuban War that they were first used. The British would round up civilians in areas where fighting had destroyed their homes and eventually use these camps to imprison any civilian or family who they thought contributed to the war effort against them. By the end of the war, 26,000 women and children had died because of the camp and the poor conditions and disease inside each and every one of them. The end of the war finally came to an end with the signing of the Treaty of Varing on May 31st, 1902 which saw the complete annexation of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State into the British Empire. The Boers were given money to rebuild and were promised limited self-government, which came to fruition in 1906 and 1907. The last and final outcome of this was the full creation of the Union of South Africa in 1910, when both Boer, former Boer republics were incorporated into this country. In total, 347,000 British soldiers and 47,000 Boers fought in the war. The British suffered 22,092 killed and 22,828 wounded, while the Boers suffered 6,189 killed. However, the worst statistic in this is the 46,370 civilians who were casualties of the war. The war is also economically devastating to the area. An estimated cost for the British government being a modern day 202 million British pounds. Yet, the most important impact of the war can be seen in the creation of the social conditions in which apartheid could later come to power during South Africa in 1948. Another thing that isn't really talked too much about this war is what it had on the impact of British politics at the time. When the new elections in 1906 occurred, the Conservative Party, which had been very big advocates for this war ended up losing the most seats they ever had before and it began to shape British politics that would reflect during the time of the First World War. Also earlier mentioned was the German contribution to stoking the flames of war and that also did not help when German anti-German sentiment popped up in the UK. All in all, the Boer War was a great example of what would happen later on with World War I, especially in terms of defensive warfare. The fact that 47,000 Boers could hold off 347,000 British soldiers, granted, not all at once, but there were multiple battles that you could see where a small force of Boers, such as 8,000 Boers defeating 21,000 British, where that helped. And that was because of the strong influence of defensive-style warfare. The Boer Wars, along with the uh, Russo-Japanese War that would happen a little later on, would be great ways to show the world about what could happen with defensive warfare 